morning. None of my computer stuff wanted to work this morning. So. Been a battle already. Okay, let's see here. You guys had two chapters over the weekend, chapters eight and nine. Eight was on um, nutrition, different diets, that type of thing. And that's actually a really important topic because we are what we eat in a very, very real sense. And it's important for CNAs to know this because we're the ones that pass trays, that go get snacks for the patient. And we're in the room way more than the um, nurses are. So we're in a position to see if they're having food brought in from the outside or snacking inappropriately or that type of thing. We need to understand the importance of that, the important role that diet plays in uh, overall health. So have you guys ever um, gone to the movies and gotten popcorn? When you're eating popcorn, you also need something to drink. Why is that? Why can't you just eat popcorn and not have anything to drink? Okay, it's salty, that's right. <clears throat> so that's kind of important because remember I said, Way back when we learned about diabetes, that sugar can't be excreted well. It either has to be used or stored, and anything left just circulates. And that's how we end up with high sugar in the blood or high blood sugar, which leads to diabetes. You guys remember that? Well, salt is a very similar situation. So with salt, it's very difficult to excrete excess salt. You can excrete some of it, but it's, it's difficult. A little easier than glucose, but still difficult. So when you have a lot of salt in the bloodstream and we can't get rid of it out of the bloodstream, then the only option, because you can't store salt, it doesn't get stored in fat cells like sugar does. The only option that the body has is to dilute it. So that means you've got fluid all in your body, inside cells, inside blood, in between cells, which is called interstitial fluid. You got fluid kind of everywhere in your body. When you eat excess salt, the body is gonna take some of that excess fluid and bring it into the bloodstream. Well, what do you think that does to the amount, the, the volume of blood inside a blood vessel? If we're adding it. more water. It makes it bigger or more quantity. Okay, so our quantity or our volume inside the blood vessels increases. Are you guys familiar with high blood pressure? right? Remember I said with blood pressure, it's like standing at the faucet, turning it on and off, on and off. Well, what we do when we eat a lot of salt is that pulls fluid into the vascular system and it raises the blood pressure. Well, if we've got somebody that already has high blood pressure, we probably don't want to raise it further, which is why people on high blood pressure medications are on low salt diets. Now that's important because if you walk in the patient's room and you see that they are eating um, French fries that somebody brought in from you know outside, a family member or friend or something brought in from outside, that's something you're probably gonna want the nurse to know because when the patient's blood pressure is taken later and it's high, it, it's a response to what they ate, not necessarily a metabolic issue. Good morning. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So we use certain diets to help um, treat different 
condition. So if we have a diabetic patient, we don't want them to have a lot of excess sugar in the diet because remember, they can't utilize that sugar inside the cells. So whatever sugar they take in, it's just gonna go circulate in the blood system. And we know that's bad. If a patient has um, advanced kidney disease, then we don't want a lot of protein because protein is very, very hard for the kidneys to filter. And at, in end-stage renal disease, the kidneys end up with a lot of um, big holes in it, uh, in the, the filtration system, because of those sugar molecules, kind of punches big holes. Think of it like cheesecloth that's been scrubbed too many times. It's those little holes in it. Um, so your patient may be on a low protein diet, or they may be on a uh, reduced fluid diet, what we call fluid restriction, because if the body can't push out that excess fluid, it's just going to build up in the system. So there's a lot of things that we treat with diet. And it's important for you to understand that if we don't adhere to those diet restrictions, the patient's going to have consequences, physical consequences. But also it's important that we make sure that patients get the right diet tray. So if you're passing trays and you give Henry um, Robert's tray, you can't just let them continue eating them. When you realize that you've made the mistake, you need to go get those trays because there's long-term health consequences that can happen. So you would go up to them and say, I'm so sorry, I gave you the wrong tray. You're gonna take it and give them the, the, a replacement. You can't give Henry Robert straight once he started eating it, right? So you're going to give him some replacement trays. Don't just think, oh, well, it's fine and move on. It may not be fine. Does that make sense? So super important that we understand the role that diet plays. You also had chapter nine, and that was on rehabilitation. And a big part of that chapter was actually um, learning the different positions. So you had prone and supine and fowlers and lateral. Um, those are all positions you actually need to know because you may see them on the state exam. So there's a couple ways to remember this. Prone is posterior up, right? Prone means the, the bottom is facing up. Uh, supine is on your spine. So laying on your back. Fowlers, another name for chicken is fowl, right? So if you're going to eat fried chicken, what position do you need to be in? Sitting up. So high fowlers is a sitting up position. Lateral means laying on your side. But you need to know those. And then there's another one that's like really weird. It's the only one that has like a, a name. It's Sims position. So all the rest are, are <coughs> this is like a name, right? Sims position. Well, Sims position is if you sleep on your side, you, you probably sleep in a Sims position. It's laying on your side with one knee bent and pulled up. But specifically, it's laying on your left side with the right leg bent and, and positioned up. So that's the Sims position. Good morning. Um, you need to know all those. Flashcards helps, you know, make flashcards but you do need to know those. And the rest of the rehabilitation chapter kind of talked about um, all the work that goes into restoring somebody to their highest level of function. And we have a whole team for that. There's nursing, there's physical therapy, there's occupational therapy, there's speech therapy, there's all kinds of devices that we can use. There's, um, you know, different adaptive equipment and all of that was covered in chapter nine. You're not gonna have a ton of questions about that in chapter nine, but there will be a few. Now, the last chapter in the book, this is your homework for tonight, is chapter 10. And chapter 10 is about um, <coughs> employability, stress management, how to get a job, how to keep a job, how to remain sane while you have a job, those types of things. So. You'll probably want to read through chapter 10, but most of it should be reviewed for you. Should be pretty easy. Okay.
And we're going to go over some of that on Wednesday as well. So anybody have any questions on what you um, read over the weekend? Anything I can help explain for you? In, in the chapter on feeding in here, it says to pull the curtain. Yeah, if there's a discrepancy between what I say and what your reading textbook says, always go by me. Okay, that's what I thought. Yeah, and that's because what I'm teaching you is very specific to the state requirements. Okay. The other textbook, I have you read it because it's got a lot of good useful information, but it's not as specific as what, because it has to kind of cover the whole nation and every state's a little bit different. So it's more along the lines of um, broad general. My stuff is gonna be very specific to what we have to focus on. All right, any other questions? It's a good one. Let me get your scores. Christy? I'm a zero on both. <laughs> very good. Jane? Zero. Thank you. Nicole? Jamie? I got 100 on me and 95 on, on a nine. Very good. Novali? Zero and two. Thank you. Isabella? Zero. Okay. Isabella, do you have five, six, and seven for me? Somehow I missed them. Yeah, I think I was a little late those days. Do you know what pages they were on again? Sure. I want to say it was like one and two, but I don't want to go. 136, 137, and 138. Yeah, one and then two. Okay, uh, for chapter six? Chapter five and then chapter six. Okay, do you have seven for me as well? One. Thank you very much. Hey, Berlin. Uh, eight was a hundred and nine was twenty five. Thank you. Do you also have five, six, and seven? Yes. Uh, five was a hundred, six was ninety five, and seven was a hundred. Thank you very much. All right. Anybody have any questions on what you uh, missed on those on those chapters? Any questions on what you missed? Okay. How do you feel about the class so far? You're about to graduate. Graduate on Wednesday. Goes quick, doesn't it? Do you feel like you've learned anything? Do you feel like you're getting ready to take the test you're feeling a little more confident you probably feel like you need a little more practice so one of the cautions that i want to give to you is register for the test don't wait because right now you're at that point that you're like okay well yeah i probably could use some extra practice so i'm going to wait until i'm comfortable and then register for the test don't do that because you're never going to be comfortable. And the longer you get from the class, the less comfortable you'll be. Because, you know, three, four weeks go by and now you're starting to think, oh my gosh, you know, am I going to remember what I need to remember? Because a lot can happen in four weeks. We just realized that, right? You learned a lot in four weeks. Well, you can lose a lot as well if you're not utilizing it on a daily basis. So don't wait, you are ready for the test. You're way more ready than you think you are because the problem is that you watch me do these skills and you think, oh, that's easy. And then you get up and practice and realize, oh, it's not so easy, I need more work. Well, you're comparing yourselves to me and that's not fair because the test is not comparing you to me. The test is comparing you to other yous, okay? So don't be too hard on yourselves and register for the test. I've had a lot of students that came back through six, eight, 12 months later because they didn't take the test and now they don't feel they're ready. 
I want you guys to succeed. There's a, a million job openings out there. We are in the middle of a CNA shortage. There's a million opportunities out there and we really, really need to get these positions filled so that these patients get the right care. So get certified and take one of those positions or two or three. All right. So any questions before we move on? This is actually a short day for us. Um, I'm going to teach uh, up until break and then the rest of the class you will have for practice. So I have three skills to learn. One of them is a range of motion. We know those are easy. We just follow the instructions. Super short, the test gives you, uh, or says somebody with your level of experience should be able to do that skill in four minutes. So super short skill. We're also going to learn catheter care. Now catheter care is fairy care with an extra step. So everything we learned last week for fairy care, we're gonna do again. So we're gonna use the leaves method. We're gonna wipe from the top down, middle, side, side, skin fold, skin fold. But instead of turning the patient over and washing their backside, we're gonna wash the tubing instead because the tubing is collecting the urine. So the patient's not laying in urine. Okay, does that make sense? So pericare is front and back. Catheter care is front and tube but the front part's all the same, okay? So you already know most of that skill. And we're gonna learn how to empty the urinary drainage bag, which is a catheter bag. That's the bag that attaches to the catheter. And we're going to learn how to um, empty that, measure it, and then clean the basin like we clean everything else. That is a documentation skill though. And there's a lot of infection control with that one. In fact, like the entire skill is infection control and documentation. So we're gonna talk a little bit about that as well, but there's not a whole lot for me to teach you today. There's lot, not a lot of new stuff. We are gonna talk about catheters though, because catheters are something you're probably not all that comfortable with. You may not have ever even seen one. So I wanna to explain to you how catheters work um, how we use them, what we're allowed to do, what we're not allowed to do, and the infection control risks for the patient with the catheter. So we have a lot to cover for that one, but the skills themselves are actually pretty easy. Okay. So good morning to all of you on YouTube. Um, Gregory, stick around till after, uh, after my lectures. Gregory needs some help getting into a CNA class, so I'll go over that with you. And Priya, good morning. All right, guys. So hopefully you guys on YouTube can hear me. We are under 100 subscribers needed to hit that 100,000 mark. Yeah, we're now down under 100. So I need like 98, I think it is, subscribers to hit that 100,000 mark. So we'll have it by Wednesday. Lot to celebrate on Wednesday. It's gonna be a good day. <coughs> good morning, Joey. All right, guys. So let's go to page 57 in your book. And how do we know what to do with each patient? The care plan. So for this skill, our care plan tells us to provide the following range of motion exercise to the resident's right hip, knee, and ankle. Flexion, extension. So that's all we're doing here. We're going to do flexion, extension of the hip and knee. That's kind of a two-for-one exercise. I'll show you that in a minute. And we're going to do flexion, extension of the ankle. We need to provide three repetitions of each exercise. And the resident is not able to help. So that means that we're going to do all the work. So flexion extension is an up down motion. <coughs> so when we have a patient laying in bed, we're gonna place our hand underneath 
this part of the thigh or under the knee, either one is fine, but you want to support at or near the joints. We're also going to lift underneath the ankle. Remember, we always lift from below with a flat palm, never from above, ever. Never catch yourself doing this. So we're going to lift from below with a flat palm. We're going to support at both joints, and we're going to bend the knee up like the patient's walking upstairs. Now, when we do this, we want to bend the whole thing. So we're bending at the hip and the knee at the same time. We don't want to do a straight leg raise. Now, the reason for that, if you try to keep this leg straight as you raise it up, um, that puts a lot of pressure on your sciatic nerve. Now, the sciatic nerve is a really big nerve that runs from your lower back down through your buttocks and down into your heel. It's what the main nerve that gets all the signals from the foot and takes it to the brain. Well, when you do a straight leg raise, it pulls that nerve super tight. There's not much room there. And when it pulls that nerve super tight, the patient can experience pain. So we don't want a straight leg raise here. Anytime you're bending at the hip, you need to bend at the knee too, unless the care plan indicates otherwise. Does that make sense? This puts less pressure on that nerve and is better tolerated by the patient. So we're gonna lift from below. We're gonna bend the knee up to the chest like they're walking upstairs all the way back to the bed. And we'll do that three times because that's what our care plan tells us, three repetitions. Good. Then we're gonna lift the leg from below, support at the ankle from below. And we're going to bend the foot forward like they're stepping on a gas pedal and back gently toward the head. So the patient's gonna feel a stretch up the back of their leg, but again, you don't wanna force this. We only go to the point of pain or resistance. So we're going to bend this just back a little bit so they feel that stretch. Watch faces for your cues. If the patient winces or grimaces or you know, looks apprehensive or anything like that, don't go so far. Right? We're watching for pain or resistance. You'll also feel it in your, you know, your um, performance. Good. How many repetitions? Three. Why? Care plan says. That's what the care plan says. All right. So let me get somebody. Oh, let me move that. Let me get somebody over on the other bed. I remember how to do this. Well, I have to read up on that. I don't remember how to do it. <laughs> Let me have somebody come over here, lay down in the bed for me. All right, if I wasn't sure which, um, hip, knee, and ankle I was supposed to exercise, what should I do? Check the care plan. Can somebody look at the care plan and tell me which? The right, the right. The right hip, knee, and ankle. What do you think happens if I mix this up and work on her left? It could be bad. It could be bad. It could be bad. So I could end up injuring the patient. What do you think that's going to do to my score? Yeah, not because I just messed up a little bit, but because of the consequence to the patient, right? Does that make sense? All right, here we go. Hi, Ms. Jones. My name is Patty. I'm your CNA today. How are you? Good, how are you? Fantastic. I need to do some exercises on your right hip, knee, and ankle. Is that okay? 
I'm going to close your curtain. Let me go wash my hands and I'll be right back. I had plenty of hands. All right, Miss Jones, I'm going to do all the pain, or all the pain. <laughs> I'm going to do all the work here. All you have to do is let me know if there's any pain or discomfort, okay? So if you feel anything at all, let me know. The first thing I'm going to do is lift your leg up and bend your knee <coughs> towards your chest and back down to the bed. We're going to do this three times, okay? And I'll do all the work. So under the knee, under the heel, we're going to bend the knee and go up and all the way down. Feel okay? Any pain? We're going to do that again, up, all the way down. Let's do one more. Up, all the way down. Feel okay? Any pain? No. Okay, I'm going to lift your, your uh, foot off your bed and bend the foot forward and back like you're stepping on a gas pedal. You should feel a little stretch with this. Now, you don't want the heel on the bed while you do this because it scrapes against the sheet, and that can cause friction burns, or it can actually even cause a cut in the skin. So we want to get that heel off the bed when we do this. And we're going to bend forward and then back. Relax for me. Feel that stretch. Forward, back. Feel okay? Forward, back. Good. Are you comfortable? Yes. Is there anything else I can get for you while I'm here? No, I'm here. Would you like a magazine before I go? No, it's okay. Okay, so curtains open. The environment is clean. Let me get your call light for you. Okay, here's your call light. If you need anything at all, let me know, okay? Wash my hands. Think about the steps of my scale. I probably review the care plan one more time. And then tell the evaluator my skill is done. Thank you. Questions? It's kind of amazing. <coughs> Remember that for the test, you're going to have skills um, assigned to you. And those skills are already pre-packaged into sets. Each skill set has three skills. It's gonna have one ADL skill. Do you remember what ADLs are? Everyday living. Yeah, activities of daily living. So bathing, dressing, grooming, that type of thing. So um, hand and nail care would be an ADL skill. Mouth care, denture care, foot care, partial bed bath. Those are all ADL skills, right? Bedpan, also an ADL skill because toileting is part of ADLs. Then you have mobility skills. Mobility would be any of the range of motions. Remember, we covered three, shoulder, elbow, wrist, and we just did hip knee and ankle. Ambulate with a gait belt, transferring from bed to wheelchair, and changing position to sideline position. So you're going to get one skill out of the ADL category, one skill out of the mobility category, and one skill out of the documentation category. So that would be pulse, respirations, feeding a resident, and the one we're going to get to today, which is emptying the drainage vat. So on page 18 of your book, 18, it's either 16 or 18. It explains those categories. Is it 16? Yeah. Okay, sorry about that. 16. It explains those categories and how you will be assigned one skill per category. And then you can see on page 17, all of those care plan sets. So we've talked about those throughout the program, but this is going to become much more important to you now that you're, you have all the skills under your belt to be able to practice. Okay. Good. Questions? No? Okay. All right, we're going to move on to catheter care now. Go to page 114 in your skills book.
And let's review a normal functioning urinary system. So a normally functioning urinary system is going to have kidneys. Those kidneys are gonna filter urine, filter blood and pull out the impurities and create urine. And that happens 24 hours a day. You guys remember that? They never stop. So that means that urine is made 24 hours a day. And that urine is gonna drip, drip, drip down ureters or tubes that puts that urine into a bladder. And all that bladder does is hold the urine until it's convenient for you to go get rid of all of it. There's a little valve at the bottom that holds that urine in the bladder. That valve is what's responsible for you staying dry. This is a normal functioning urinary system. When we have a catheter, that system is still working. Nothing has changed up here. The only thing that has changed is we are holding that valve open with a tube. So we insert the catheter that holds that valve open. We're gonna inflate a little balloon at the top of the catheter just to keep it inside the bladder. It's kind of like a doorstop. But if you look, that balloon is inside the bladder. You can't really feel that because your bladder is a big hollow organ. So you don't really feel this tube. Now, if you inflated it here, you would feel it for sure. But once we get into the bladder and inflate that little balloon, it shouldn't be felt by the patient. But what the patient will feel is this, and this has to be kind of a tight fit because remember it's liquid, right? Urine is liquid, liquid always finds a way. Well, if we don't have the catheter snug in the urethra and we're holding that valve open, that means that urine can leak around the catheter because the catheter isn't taking up enough space. Does that make sense? So catheters need to be snug. Now that's uncomfortable. Have you ever put an earring in and it was just a little bit too big and a little bit too heavy? right? It doesn't really hurt, quote unquote, but it's very irritating. It's annoying. It's uncomfortable until you get used to it. Does that make sense? Catheters are the same way, but there's another sensation with a catheter that um, patients get really upset or confused by, and I want to explain this to you so that you understand what's happening here. Now, your entire life, right? You, you don't walk around with a catheter. So your entire life, let's go back one. Your entire life, the only thing that's ever been in that bladder is urine. So when the urine gets high enough and hits the top of the bladder, the brain says, oh, we're full. We must need a bathroom, right? So the only thing that's ever hit the top of your bladder is urine. Now, when we have a catheter in place and we inflate that balloon, there's a little tiny piece of it that sticks up and that's going to hit the top of your bladder. <clears throat> now, what's the only thing that's ever hit the top of your bladder? Urine. Yeah, pee. So your bladder doesn't know what this is. It assumes it's pee. Your bladder, when it feels this, assumes it's Full. So when we put a catheter in a patient and nurses are the ones that put catheters in and take them out, you can be trained. <laughs> you can be trained in certain circumstances with routine patients. Remember, we always do normal, right? So routine tasks, stable patients. So if you're working in a um, same day surgery center and you're in post-op right before people go home, we put catheters in during surgery because we don't want you peeing on our sterile fields. So they're going to have a catheter, but they don't go home with that catheter. So somebody has to take it out. Well, these are stable patients. This is a very routine task. So you could be trained to take a catheter out before they go home. So it is delegatable. But right now, 
entry level CNAs do not do this. This is nursing. But when nurses put these catheters in, the patients may start to feel like, oh my gosh, I've got to pee. I have to pee. I have to pee. I want you to know that's normal. It's absolutely normal for the patient to feel like they have to pee when we first put a catheter in. And that sensation goes away after about 10 to 12 hours. So if your patient can distract themselves, get involved in a good movie, read a book, take a nap, you're trying to distract themselves, the body gets used to that sensation after about 10 to 12 hours if the catheter has to stay in. Make sense? Good. So the only thing that we're doing here, one more time, the only thing that catheter is accomplishing is holding that valve open. And instead of the pee coming out naturally, it's gonna come down through the catheter. Now catheters alone aren't gonna help much because all that's gonna do is allow pee to go everywhere. It just, you know, think of the catheter as a urethra. We need to attach that catheter to a collection device of some sort. Now, this can be a bedside bag or a leg bag. We're gonna to get to that in just a few minutes. So when we have a catheter, the nurse is gonna insert the catheter beyond this valve into the bladder. And when we start to get urine coming through the catheter, we know we're in the bladder. And then they're gonna inflate a little balloon on the bottom of the catheter. And that's what you see here. So this is a catheter with a balloon inflated. Now I can't get this into somebody. That balloon is way too big. So in order to get this in an individual, the balloon is not going to be inflated. It's gonna look more like this, flat. It wouldn't, whoops, wouldn't have this piece. I'll just kind of take that piece away for a minute. It would be flat. We put this in, once, once it's in place, we use a syringe on this port and fill that up <coughs> with water. Now it'll stay in place. It's a little doorstop. But like I said, this alone isn't gonna solve any problems because that's just gonna let pee go everywhere. So that means that this needs to be attached to some sort of a collection device. Now that might be a bedside bag, which is what you see here. This is a bedside bag. It holds a lot of urine. We use these mostly in hospitals or if the patient's at home and not really mobile. But if the patient is out in the community, nobody wants to carry a suitcase full of urine with them. That just looks a little weird. They're gonna get stared at. So instead of holding one of these, they're going to use a leg bag, which is a smaller version, and it attaches to the inner thigh or the calf with um, elastic bands or Velcro. And same, it, it, it attaches the exact same way, has the same tubing, but it's shorter. And this allows you to conceal a urine bag under your clothing, and nobody knows that you have a catheter. But it's not gonna hold as much. Now, most of the time, patients with leg bags can empty them themselves. They'll go to the bathroom and open a little valve on the bottom of the bag and let the urine go into the toilet, okay? So think of this just as an external bladder. Good? Question? If they're able to get around and empty their own bag, why do they have a catheter? So there's a lot of reasons that we would have a catheter. We tend to think of... Um, catheters is more uh, uh, acute care, like if you're having surgery or if you're having a baby and you had an epidural, we need a catheter. Because when you have an epidural, we numb you from here down. So you don't feel your legs. You don't even know you have legs anymore. <laughs> so there's no way you can go to the bathroom, right? You also can't control that bowel because everything is asleep. So because of that, we generally put in a catheter when you have an epidural. Um, 
other reasons that you would have a catheter, let's say you have COVID and you're in ICU on a ventilator. Well, you certainly can't get up and go to the bathroom because you're on a ventilator. A catheter would be indicated. But there's other reasons that we would need a catheter as well. And a lot of those have to do with neurologic impairment. So let's say that we have a baby that has spina bifida. Now, what this is, is your spinal cord, right? Your main big trunk of a nerve that connects your brain all the way down your spine to everything. Okay. Now, spina bifida is that spinal cord doesn't stay inside the spine where it's supposed to. It actually loops up outside of the body. So babies that are born with spina bifida don't always have control of things, you know, below the chest. So they may have difficulty walking. They may have difficulty controlling the valve. They may have difficulty opening the valve, which means it's stuck in the closed position forever. So in that case, we may have to do something called an intermittent cath. So an intermittent cath is something like this. This is a catheter just like this one. The big difference is it doesn't have a balloon. So this would be put in just long enough to empty the bladder, and then it's gonna be taken out. And we're gonna do that every four or six hours as needed for their entire life. Um, but it's better than, than having a catheter all the time, okay? So intermittent cath. That can also happen with certain surgeries as well. So um, men that have prostate surgery, there's a lot of nerves in that area. And sometimes accidentally, one of those nerves that controls that valve gets stuck or gets cut, and then it gets stuck in that closed position with no way to open it. They would also need a catheter of some sort, either an intermittent or an indwelling. Okay, so this one doesn't stay in. There's nothing to keep it in. We just put it in, empty the urine, take it out. This one stays in for up to 30 days and then it'll have to get changed out. So it's put in, the balloon is inflated and it stays in as long as we need it. Um, every 30 days, indwelling catheters need to be changed out. That's gonna be a nurse's job but every 30 days, good. Once a week is how often the bags need to be changed. So because these are good for 30 days, but these are only good for a week, then they have to be two separate pieces that are attached together. CNAs do not attach or disattach the bag from the catheter unless you've had training, good. Questions so far? Questions? There's a lot of reasons you would have a catheter. Th those are just a few. But um, it's very surprising how many people actually have catheters that you have no idea. I mean, they're walking around with Dixie with you. They're at Bush Gardens. They're living a normal life except they have this urinary problem and they need a little help. So catheters are not as uncommon as you would think. And it's one of the few things that you're going to encounter, not just in a clinical setting. Is, I'm, I've noticed a lot of this stuff like is pertaining to females when males have catheters or like, yep. It's the exact same, the same thing. exact same catheter. The only difference is because males have more tissue there, right? You have to go through the whole, the penile tissue to get to the bladder. So we're just going to insert it a little bit further. Female urethras are only about as long as your pinky. Male urethras are about roughly one and a half times that. Okay. Could be a little bit more, a little bit less, but that's kind of our ballpark. So where you would insert a female catheter about that far, 
you may insert a nail catheter about that far. But we're going to go until we hit gold, until we get urine. And then we advance it just a little bit more and inflate that balloon. But this whole process, we have to use very strict infection control <laughs> procedures with. Um, and let me explain to you why. So we talked about this a little bit last week when we talked about pericare. I told you that the bladder is the ideal breeding environment for pathogens. Every pathogen is looking for a bladder to get into because it doesn't, it's not just warm, dark, and moist, which we know is a good place. It also has um, proteins and enzymes that bacteria can use to replicate. So this really is the ideal breeding environment. Now we've got a few bouncers in the urethra that are able to say, hey, you don't belong, get out. But when we have a catheter, those bouncers can't see what's on the inside of the catheter. That means that bacteria can get in there, eat, drink, be merry, zip themselves in half, and before long, you have a whole bunch of bacteria that are all able to invade at the same time. So if this was just a small invasion, one or two bacteria, your body could probably fight it off. But when you have one or two trillion that show up like that, because all of their multiplication happened in here, out of our view, we had no idea that was happening. So they eat, they drink, they multiply, they eat, they drink, they multiply, they start to climb. They eat, they drink, they multiply, they climb. They eat, they drink, they multiply, they climb. By the time they get to this hole at the top, there are trillions. Now we get an invasion of trillions and the body's like, yeah, I can't do that. <laughs> I can't fight against this. And catheters can cause very, very serious infections. Now on top of that, if you have a catheter, chances are you got something else going on with you. We don't put catheters in healthy people just because, right? So you got something going on with you. Your immune system is already busy with that something that's going on. Does that make sense? So we really have to um, watch infection control with this process very, very closely. And that means keeping the catheter and the area around the catheter clean. So once a shift, we're going to do catheter care. But part of that is going to be inspecting the tubing and the bag as well. So part of catheter care means to look at the whole system. We don't separate it, but we do wanna look. We don't want that bag hanging on the floor because pathogens, we also don't want the tubing hanging on the floor because my foot can get stuck in it and pull it out. I don't want to lift this bag above the level of the patient's hips because if I do that, it causes the urine to run right back in. And I don't know about you, but recycled urine, kind of high on my gross meter, right? I don't want recycled urine. Your patient doesn't either. Anybody ever watch those Discovery Health shows on TV, right? I was watching one um, last week or the week before, and they were walking this guy after surgery in the hallway, and the tech or the CNA or the nurse, I'm not sure who it was, um, had the, the urine bag in her hand, and she's got her hand up here on the patient's back, and I'm like, don't do that. Don't do that. That's not good. <laughs> We always need to make sure that this bag is lower than the patient's hips. Does that make sense? Good. Do you guys understand this? Huge infection risk. Huge. So cleanliness is going to be the name of the game. <laughs> so again, you don't, this is what I was just talking about. You don't want to lift the bag above the level of the patient's hips because whatever urine is in there is just going to flow right back into the patient. Now there are some of these bags have what we call anti-reflex valves. 
um, which is designed to help prevent this, but it's not a good idea ever to, to allow that urine to run back into the patient. Anything that's coiled up next to the floor can cause somebody to trip and catheters get pulled out. They do. They get pulled out by patients all the time because patients will roll over in bed and the catheter stays where it's put. You know, so patients will pull catheters out. Sometimes they'll tug on them because they don't belong. They feel odd, foreign. So they'll kind of tug on them. If they have dementia, they'll pull them right out because it doesn't feel like it is supposed to be there, right? It's foreign, it's odd. But believe it or not, CNAs pull out way more catheters than patients do. And this is one of the ways that we do it. We don't pay attention to where the tubing is. So our feet get caught up in it and we end up pulling it out. We also pull out catheters when we turn a patient over onto their side, because if I'm leaning against the bed, as I'm rolling the patient over and I'm trapping that tubing between the bed and my leg, the patient will roll, but the catheter isn't going to. But probably the most common way to remove a catheter uh, improperly is when we're transferring a patient out of bed and into a wheelchair or ambulating them. That's the most frequent time that catheters get pulled out because you'll stand the patient up, you'll start walking and they'll feel a little tug or a little resistance. But if they don't know what that is, they'll keep walking and they'll walk right out of that catheter. It'll just pop right out. Now, this freaks CNAs out <coughs> big time, right? Because you've got something this big going through a tube this big. You're going to get tissue tearing. That's just a fact of life, right? You can't have something this big going through a space this big and not have consequences. So when you have tissue tearing, you generally have some blood alongside of it. Now, this isn't going to be a huge amount of blood, but it will be a little bit. And your patient's probably going to complain of stinging or pain. Well, yeah, we got a this size balloon going through a space this size, we're tearing it and we got urine right there, right? So you're gonna have some stinging. So there's a couple things you need to know about catheters that get pulled out. The first is don't hide it. CNAs try to hide this all the time. Don't hide it. Own it. You need to go to the nurse and let them know, hey, the catheter came out. And you got to do it quick because anytime that there's tearing, remember, you got to balloon this big, go through space this big. Anytime there's tearing, there will always be swelling. So if I have swelling in the area and I have to get another catheter in, that swelling may prevent me from being able to do so. So I've only got 30 to 45 minutes to make my move, to figure out, do we need a catheter there or can we do without? If we need a catheter there, I got to get one in before that swelling sets in. If we don't need a catheter, oh man, that's going to sting like crazy every time this person pees. That is not going to be comfortable, but that may be what we have to deal with, which means I've got to prepare the patient for what's coming. Does that make sense? Now, if you don't let me know, if the catheter comes out and you try to hide it, you kind of kick it under the bed, you don't let anybody know, shift chain change occurs, a new crew comes on and they realize that the catheter is out and they have no idea how long it's been, that patient is going to need a whole lot more care than they would have if we could have just addressed it quicker. Does that make sense? So the first rule is don't hide it. The second rule is don't throw it away <laughs> because I have to inspect it. When you come to me and you say, hey, the catheter came out, I have to go look at this. Now, if it's intact, if this balloon is still holding water, if everything looks just like this, fine, no problem. We can work with that. This is good. I know it doesn't seem good for the patient, but this is good. This is very bad because if the balloon is not intact, that means a piece of it 
probably stayed behind in the patient. This I can work with. This requires the surgeon. Big difference. The only way for me to know is to visually inspect it. So don't throw it away. Um, you need to put it in a bag. And every trash can in a clinical setting, every single trash can has <laughs> empty bags in the bottom. So take the current bag out. There's fresh empty bags in the bottom. Go grab one, put this whole thing in. The bag, the catheter, everything, put it in. Put it in the bathroom. And then come let me know. And I'll go inspect it. Does that make sense? Good. So this is what it looks like when a balloon has burst. And this does happen when, um, when they've been left in for quite some time. Remember, urine is acid. It eats these balloons. These balloons are super thin. You can see how thin they are here. So I'm going to pass these around along with the red Robinson or the intermittent cap. Now these that stay in, these are called Foley or indwelling catheters. This catheter is an intermittent or Red Robinson. You'll hear them describe both ways. I find it's helpful for students to be able to see a catheter and know how, what's happening on the inside of the body and how to troubleshoot rather than um, just kind of leaving you guys wondering. When you see it and you know that it's not all that scary, that it's nothing more than a straw with a balloon, um, it does take some of the fear out of it, okay? And that's all it is. It's a flexible straw with a balloon. You always want the bag attached to a non-moving part of the bed. And you want to make sure that there's enough tubing that allows the patient to roll or move around in the bed unobstructed. Otherwise, it'll get pulled out. Okay. So we've talked about this, but the um, most common times that catheters are pulled out is when you turn a patient over in bed, when you're transferring a patient to a chair, or when you're ambulating a, a resident. But they can also be pulled out when you're getting it tangled in tubing that's under the floor, uh, confused patients, or patients that intentionally pull it out because they just plain don't want it. Catheters are only used when there's a physical necessity. But we learned pericare, right? So if a patient is incontinent, we do peri care every two hours. Peri care is designed to keep the patient clean and dry as much as possible. But a lot of people think, well, if the patient's incontinent, then they need a catheter. And that's actually not true. The urine has a way out all by itself. It doesn't need help. We only use catheters if the urine can't come out by itself or if the urine is coming out by itself at inopportune times, like surgery, okay? But incontinence alone is not a reason to pull, put a catheter in. It increases the um, possibility of a catheter-acquired infection, which are very, very serious. In fact, what we call CAUTI, C-A-U-T-I, you'll hear that term, C-A-U-T-I, is a catheter-acquired urinary tract infection, CAUTI. CAUTIs kill about 2,500 people a year. That's how serious this is. This is not just, you know, something that we can kind of ignore. This is very serious. So we need to understand our responsibilities here. We need to understand the infection control risks for the patient. And we do need to understand that these are not used for convenience. They're used when the urine has no other way out. Um, and again, this is just a graphic that shows that when you're walking a patient, it's really easy to pull a catheter out. There's not much there that gives a lot of resistance to this. That valve, it'll let that pop out. I mean, you can, you can tug on it a little bit, 
But if that bag is attached to something, as the patient is walking, it will come out. So when a catheter does come out accidentally, we want to make sure we're putting it into a bag and leaving it in a visible place for the nurse to inspect. And if you're going to document using words, you would want to document just the facts, just the facts. So in this case, it would be something like catheter found lying, laying in patient's bed, catheter and balloon intact. Um, you could say that you notified the RN or whatever your next steps were. Most times, most places do not allow CNAs to document with words. Most places, CNAs are limited to documenting numbers, pulse, respiration, blood pressure, temperature, food intake, urinary drainage bag, numbers. When we start using words in documentation, lawyers are allowed to get a hold of that and may use it against us. And a lot of times we say things that maybe we, they sounded good at the time, but maybe they're not written quite right legally. So here is our care plan for this. Provide catheter care with soap and water to a female resident with an indwelling urinary catheter. Clean the catheter tubing and perineal area only. So that's our care plan for this one. We have a female mannequin, this is a mannequin skill, with a catheter and she will have an actual catheter in her. We're going to clean the catheter and then clean the area around it. Does not matter what order you do it. You want to do the pericare first and then the catheter, that's fine. If you want to do the catheter first then the pericare, that's fine. Nobody cares which comes first, but you do have to do both. Now this patient is not going to be laying on a pad like they were with pericare. Remember with pericare, they were laying on a pad that held the urine. Well, we have a catheter in a bag that's holding the urine. So we don't need a pad under them. They won't start out with a pad, but because we're cleaning, we need to protect the bedding. So we're gonna put a, a pad under the patient for the catheter care and pericare, and then take it out at the end. Now, the reason you wanna take it out is because those chucks, they're gonna hold in body heat. That's gonna make the patient sweat. And we have warm, dark, moist, what grows there? Yeah, we don't want bacteria anywhere near a catheter. So at the end of the skill, don't leave the pad under the patient. Okay, not unless we need it. Good. When you're cleaning the catheter itself, we want to hold it where it exits the body. You don't want to just wrap the washcloth around and pull. Because remember, that balloon is all that's holding that catheter in place. So we want to hold that catheter, wrap the washcloth around and pull, but this is keeping what's inside the patient stationary. Okay, we're going to clean using four cleaning strokes. One, fold or leave. Two, fold or leave. Three, fold or leave. Four, whatever we wash, we rinse. rinse. So we're going to rinse the same way. One, fold the leaf. Two, fold the leaf. Three, fold the leaf. Four, and then you'll dry. And then you'll do pericare, middle, side, side, skin fold, skin fold, rinse, middle, side, side, skin fold, skin fold, dry. Take the pad out, do your closing, you're done. Okay. But you definitely wanna hold that catheter where it exits the body. All right, so let me show you the video for this one because it has good close-ups of the catheter.
shown to my name is Patty. I'm your CMA today. How are you? Good. I need to do catheter here. Is that okay? I'm going to close your curtain, wash my hands, get my supplies, and I'll be right back. Okay, Ms. Jones, I'm going to gather my supplies. I'll start out with a barrier that provides a clean place to put my supplies. And we're going to get four washcloths, a towel, a chucks, a privacy blanket, and now I'll gather my basin and soap. And it's out of gloves. All right, Ms. Jones, I'll just get some water. I'll be right back. Okay, would you like to check the water temperature and make sure it's okay? It's good? Good. I'll place the washcloth in there to stay warm. And I'm going to cover you with a privacy blanket. This is going to help protect your privacy and keep you warm while we do this still. And I'm going to pull your sheet down to about her knees. Okay, Ms. Jones, I'm going to place this pad underneath you. This is going to help keep your bed dry while we do this skill. First, I'll roll it toward me. I'll place it on the bed. And then I'll put my gloves on. All right, Ms. Jones, can you scoot toward me, please? Thank you. And can you roll onto your left side? One, two, three. Thank you. I'm going to be very careful, making sure that the catheter tubing rolls with the patient and doesn't get pulled on. I'm going to unroll the checks underneath the patient's hip and have the patient come back onto their back, making sure that they don't lay on that catheter tubing. Ms. Jones, can you scoot to the middle of the bed, please? Thank you. Ms. Jones, can you scoot for me? Thank you. And roll up onto your right side. One, two, three. And now I can unroll the chucks to protect the bed. Come on back, Ms. Jones. And scoot to the middle of the bed. Thank you very much. Okay, now I'm going to start cleaning the catheter. I'm going to roll your gown up inside the blanket. I will be exposing you, but we'll make this as brief as possible. Please let me know if you're uncomfortable. <clears throat> as I roll the gown in the blanket, I want to make sure that I don't grab the catheter, that we don't cause any unnecessary pulling or stress on that catheter. And now we'll cover her thighs with a towel. This exposes only the area that we're working on. I'm going to take the first washcloth and wring it out and apply soap to four leaves. One, two, three, four. Now I'm going to clean your catheter. I'm going to hold the catheter where it exits the body, wrap the washcloth around, and wipe away from the body. Fold that leaf over. I'm going to fold it, wrap the washcloth around, and wipe away from the body. That's two. We're going to do this two more times. Away from the body. Three. And the last one. Four. I'll set this washcloth aside. Whenever we wash, we must rinse. So I'll wring this washcloth out, and we'll use it to rinse that catheter the same way we washed. I'm going to hold it where it exits the body, wrap the washcloth around, and wipe away from the body. We'll do this four times. Two, three, 
and four. Set this aside. Now we'll dry the cabinet. Now we're going to do fairy pan. We'll take a washcloth out of the basin, bring it out really well. And we're going to soak five corners. One, two, three, four, and the back side is five. Okay, now I'm going to clean the peri area. I'm going to lift the catheter up out of the way with my pinky and hold the labia open while I clean down the center with the first leaf. Always going to top to bottom, and then we'll remove the washcloth and fold that leaf over. Now I'm going to clean down one side of the labia, top to bottom, fold that leaf over, clean down the other side of the labia, top to bottom, fold that leaf over. I'm going to clean the skin fold between the groin and the leg, fold that leaf over, and clean the other skin fold between the groin and the leg, and then set that washcloth aside. I'm going to take the final washcloth and wring it out really well, and we're going to rinse all of those areas the same way that we washed them. So I'll fold that catheter out of the way and spread the labia open, laying down the center, top to bottom, fold that leaf over, Clean down one side of the labia, fold that leaf over, rinse down the other side of the labia, fold that leaf over. We're going to rinse the skin fold, fold that leaf over, and the other skin fold. Set that aside. Now we'll dry gently by patting dry top to bottom and then removing the towel. Ms. Jones, I'm going to cover you back up. I'll unroll that blanket, which will replace the gown over the patient. I'm going to make sure that the catheter and the tubing is coiled on the bed, not near the floor, and not where the patient is laying on it, making sure it's not tainted. Ms. Jones, I'll be right back. I need to dispose of your supplies. The towels and washcloth will be placed in dirty linen. The basin is going to be clean the way we clean everything else. We'll return the basin to the drawer and on the way we'll pick up the soap. We'll open the door with the paper towel, return the basin to the storage area. Now I'll dispose of my paper towels. Okay, Ms. Jones, I need to remove the chucks from under you. Can I get you to scoop for me, please? Thank you. And can I get you to roll them on your left side? One, two, three. Thank you. I'll roll this soil chucks toward the patient and tuck it under her hip. Come on back, Ms. Jones, and scoot back to the middle, making sure the patient is not laying on that catheter tubing. Okay, Ms. Jones, can you scoot toward me again, please? Thank you, and roll up on your right side. And I'm gonna remove that chucks from the back. Okay, you can scoot back to the middle, thank you. This is going to be thrown away. Okay, Ms. Jones, let me just look at your catheter one last time. Make sure that the catheter tubing is coiled on the bed, that the catheter is not on the floor. Everything looks good. I'm going to remove the chucks from the table, and we're going to throw this away, and then I'll remove my gloves. We'll throw those away. Okay, Ms. Jones, I'll pull your sheet up now. And I'll remove the blanket as I do so, rolling it into a ball. Let me put this in dirty linen. Okay, Ms. Jones, here's your call line. If you should need anything, just let me know. Are you comfortable? Can I get you anything while I'm here, like magazines? I'm just going to open your curtain and wash my hands. After washing my hands, I'll think about the steps of my skill, make any corrections that need to be made, and then tell the evaluator my skill is done.
questions? I get confused on when to take the gloves off <laughs> because I feel like I'm touching the basin already with gunky glove hands that have been on her hoodie. Okay. So I don't, I don't know when to take them off. Yeah. I see when you're taking them off, but okay, so, I don't get the reason. So let's kind of walk through the, the process. Okay. So we have a lot of things that we have to put away at the end of the sale. So dirty linens, those have been used for, you know, period care. So do we need to have gloves on or off to take care of the dirty linen? On. Uh, we have to take care of the basin, um, which you may have touched with the gloves while you were cleaning. Sure. Okay. So because there's a possibility of body fluids being on or around the basin, then you really do need to have gloves on when you're cleaning it, when you take it to the, the sink to clean it. Okay. Okay. Now that's why we use a paper towel to put it away. Those linens that you used, think about where the linens were used, those went on the barrier. So when you're touching the barrier, do you need gloves on? Okay. So we know we need gloves on to remove the, the linens, to remove the barrier, and to clean the basin. But this is where it gets a little tricky, okay? So you leave your gloves on for all of the cleaning. You're back to, you know, you now back to a clean table, everything's ready to go. But you have another step. You have to remove that privacy blanket and you have to pull the sheet up. Now, think about where your gloves have just been and what they've touched. Do you want to touch that sheet that's going to go right up next to her face with dirty gloves? No. No. So we're going to remove all of our supplies, do all of our cleaning, put everything away, and then remove our gloves. And then once we've, we've done all that, then we can remove the privacy blanket and pull the sheet up. And remember, we have to end the skill with what kind of hands? Clean hands. So, it, you know, touching the sheet is not a problem. You're going to go wash your hands. Okay, does that make sense? I know it can get a little bit confusing, but I can tell you that for the test, they're not grading you on infection control that harshly. They don't want those gloves to touch the sheet, understandably. And they don't want your bare hands to touch the linens that were used on the patient. So at the very least, at the very least, put all of your dirty linens away. And then if you want to remove your gloves to clean the basin, they're not gonna count it against you, but I would feel better if you kept them on. Okay? Just because I want you guys to remain healthy throughout. Does that make sense? Okay. Good. It's a good process. It just takes a little bit of learning to kind of get it in your mind. Wait a minute, what am I touching? Are my hands clean or dirty? Is that clean or dirty? And what's my next step? Because you always have to think about what's coming next. Do I need gloves for that? Okay. Good. Great question. Fantastic question. Any others? Privacy blanket. Okay. Because I know for the um, partial bath, you just leave it on and just like do the bath under the blanket, right? Right. So for peri care and for that, you lift it up? Yeah, because we have to be able to see effectively but we want to keep them covered as much as possible. Okay. So I roll the sheet right, or, or pull the sheet down to right above their knees. I roll the blanket and the gown underneath to right above their, um, kind of like at their belly button area. So the only area that's actually exposed is the area I'm physically working on. What they don't want to see 
is you pull the sheet completely off the bed and you pull the gown completely up and the patient is now laying there and feeling extremely exposed. Um, it's all about preserving as much modesty as possible. When you cover most of the legs and most of the body and all you have left is this one little area that we're working on, patients actually will feel a little more, it makes it more clinical. They'll feel a little more secure with it, um, despite what you're doing, right? Uh, they'll feel a little more secure. Great question, great question. And for partial bed bath, I'm trying to keep it covered with a blanket as much as possible because it's cold. Mm -hmm. It's cold in the room. They're wet until I have a chance to dry them off. It's cold. So I just try to keep them covered as much as possible. I mean, I will move the blanket to clean under and kind of visualize everything, but I'm gonna to try to keep them as covered as I can, just because it's comfortable. Okay, good. Questions? Anybody catch my live on Thursday? My live lesson? You'll probably want to go back and watch that one because it's on how do you how do you deal with patients that say no or patients that refuse. Um, and I talked about 35 minutes on that. So it's a really, really good lesson. Um, if you haven't had a chance to go back and watch that, I would. You're going to have several questions on the state exam on that. It's a popular topic. All right. Any other questions before we move on? All right, so I want to talk to you specifically about peri care and catheter care for just a few moments. Um, and we've talked about this as we've gone through the program, the importance of telling the patient what you're doing, communicating with them. We've talked about that all along with you. But when you're in very sensitive areas with the patient, if you're working anywhere below the waist, they need to know exactly what you're doing when you're going to do it and how it needs to be done. You need to be in constant communication. Don't just grab a wet washcloth and put it in these areas and hope for the best. That is not professional at all. But most likely it's going to make the patient very resistant to care. In order to get their cooperation, we really do need to be talking to them. Now, and, and I've seen this a lot with CNAs. They think, well, the patient has dementia. I don't have to talk to this patient. Um, or the patient's in a persistent vegetative state, what you guys would call a coma. I don't need to talk to that patient. No, you actually need to talk to them more. If somebody has dementia or difficulty processing what you're saying, then you need to spend even more time explaining what you're about to do. You need to try to get it through to them however you can so that they become cooperative. Because when you're in this very, very sensitive location, um, the, the initial reaction is going to be clamp and cover. And even though you've got a job to do and you may think to yourself, I have a job to do, um, and they have dementia, I just need to work around them or get somebody to restrain them. That's not the way to go about this. Um, we really want to communicate with patients. So sometimes this is hard because you've got to find a way to communicate with them where they're at mentally and emotionally. And that can be very difficult. Um, work with your nurses, work with your team. But the worst thing to do is to try to force somebody to um, accept this even though they're resisting. We don't use force. CNA should never use force. Does that make sense? Um, and, and it's really sad because I do, you know, the default is if the patient has dementia, we don't have to talk to them. And I really think it should be the opposite. When the patient has dementia, you need to talk to them more. You need to try to get through to them what you're doing. Don't just do things to them. 
Have you ever heard the phrase, go to your happy place? Right, if something unpleasant is happening, just go to your happy place. Well, when you are forcing somebody to have a skill done that's very personal in nature, you're gonna drive them to their happy place. You're, you're forcing them to disassociate. And when you've got a patient with dementia that's already having a difficulty associating to begin with, and now you're forcing disassociation, it can actually worsen behavior problems. Does that make sense? So disassociation and dementia are very, very dangerous friends. Okay, bad influences. Yeah, we really wanna make sure that, that we are involving them in the process. Sometimes they'll understand, sometimes they won't. It may be an hour by hour basis too, but we wanna do the best job we can. That's what separates us from others, right? We're professional caregivers. And that professional, because we're certified, that professional <coughs> is gonna require professionalism. Okay, so we gotta take it one step further. So I know in the home environment, like with my grandparents that we cared for, it was different, but in like a clinical setting when they're deaf and they can not hear anything, what is like the standard approach to communicate with them? So there's a couple of things that I do with um, deaf clients. The, well, the first is I know a little bit of sign language, so I can at least get some information from them and to them. But we also use picture boards a lot. And the dry erase boards. Yeah, dry erase boards if they have the ability to write or read. Um, picture boards if communication has broken down. Uh, and often communication boards, I can get the, um, kind of get the idea across quickly because communication boards are, it's usually a, a, a whole group of pictures, um, like, 36 pictures, six rows of six pictures. And it's the most common daily tasks. Things like toileting, eating, snack, um, walking, reading. I just like the, the, the 36 most common things you do in a day, you know, all on a board. So it's, you know, really easy for them to, to point to. And then below that is usually an alphabet where they can point to different letters and spell things out. That works pretty well. Um, if you don't have a picture board, then um, this really varies by facility, but most facilities have a sign language interpreter, either on staff, it's usually another employee that knows sign language that they pull in to interpret, or we have video. This is pretty cool. This is actually a relatively new um, possibility with all this social media and stuff. There are actually um, centers that do translation services. So the hospitals will um, contract with the center. And if you have somebody that comes in speaking French, we just call them up on a video call. They watch the patient with their facial expressions, body language. The patient speaks to them. They tell us what the patient is saying. And they can do that with uh, sign language as well. So it's a, an actual interpreter, but a lot of things are missed in um, nonverbal cues, right? That's where video comes in because a lot of stuff is transmitted through nonverbal, especially in uh, some languages and cultures. So that video component makes it super easy to interpret what others are saying. So sometimes we can use something like that with somebody that's hearing impaired as well. Pretty cool. Um, I advise all healthcare workers to learn a few phrases in a few languages, the languages that you're most commonly going to encounter in your geographic region. So here, Spanish, you should know a few phrases in Spanish. Sign language is another good one. If we lived in Louisiana, I would have you, uh, I would encourage you to le learn a few phrases in 
um, French or Cajun. If you lived in South Florida, I would te uh, have you learn a few phrases in Haitian because there's a, a larger Haitian and, and Cuban um, population of it. So wherever your geography, um, wherever you land, basically, find out what languages are the most common for the patients and learn a few phrases in those. Okay. Okay. So German, Italian, French, Spanish, a lot of languages out there, a lot. We need to learn a little bit of communication for our patients. All right, any other questions? Communication is key. Let's go to page 117. Care plan at the top of 117 tells us to empty the resident's urinary drainage bag into a graduate container and measure and record the urinary output. And remember in medicine, we use MLs or CCs. It's the same measurement, just two names for it, MLs and CCs. On the intake and output form, you can see that form there in the middle of page 117. And it's also on page 121 in a bigger version. So if we are measuring urine, would that be intake or output? Oh, I hope so. <laughs> I would not want it as intake. <laughs> So when you're looking at that um, documentation form, you need to make sure that you're documenting in the appropriate place. There's a place for intake and there's a place for output. And what do you think happens if you document the urine and in intake for the test? Probably not gonna go well. To make sure that we're documenting in the right place. So please be super careful of that. These are step by step instructions. It tells you exactly how to do the skill. Exactly. So when you're practicing, you should have this in somebody's hands, either your patients or a third party, but you should have this in somebody's hands when you're practicing. And if you get stuck, they should say, okay, well, the next thing you need to do is this. So it helps prompt you to make sure that you're practicing it appropriately. <coughs> so this is a triangular graduate container. I have these here. I'll show it to you in just a moment. But it is marked in ounces on one side and cc's on the other. Which one do we use? Cc. So we're only going to use this side. We don't pay attention to this one. Now, they're marked in 50s. You can see 100, 150, 200, 250, 300, 350. These little lines in between are your 25s. So if this is the line for 400, this would be 425. 450, 475, 500. Got it? You are going to round to the nearest line. The nearest, it doesn't matter whether it's up or down, nearest line. So when you're documenting, you should have 350 or 375. You should not have 362. There's no way for you to tell 362 on this scale. So 350 or 375, whichever it's closest to. Good? For the test, is there going to be like water or something? It's actually yellow tinted water. Okay. Yes. And they do tint it yellow to make it easier to read for you. Otherwise, it would be difficult. So this is a, a urinary graduate container. This is what it looks like, just like the one on the screen. I'm going to pass this around so you guys can... <laughs> Take a look at it. The ones with the black markings on it are way easier to read 
But if you turn it uh, a third of the way around, you'll actually see that there's markings on it in that clear plastic. Those are way harder to read. Thankfully, the test does use the one with the black markings. So it does make it a little bit easier. And yeah, for the test, it will be yellow tinted water. Um, it's not Mountain Dew. It looks like Mountain Dew, but it's not. <laughs> um, and that just makes it easier to read. Normally, urine is a uh, light yellow to maybe a golden, you know, a little bit darker golden color. But if it's dark, like amber color, that needs to be reported. If it's super light and looks like water, that needs to be reported. So anything that, that, um, that, if you look at something and go, huh, that means it's not normal. What do we do with not normal? Yeah, we wanna tell somebody, absolutely. So you've gotta pay attention to your own kind of internal reactions to things. If you go, huh, it should automatically trigger, you need to tell the nurse, okay? But urine is not just yellow. Urine can be orange, bright orange like Gatorade orange from a certain medication. Medications can turn the urine a reddish color. And it can also, there's a specific medication that turns urine purple, like Kool-Aid. Anything unusual gets reported to the nurse. So this is what a urinary drainage bag looks like. You have one there that you were able to take a look at. There are markings on this bag. We do not use them. We are gonna empty the urine into the container and we're gonna measure it using the markings on the container, not the bag, because the bag is not accurate. This is just an eyeball, you know, just a, a, a general synopsis. But in order to get a number to write down, we're gonna use the container. Good. Questions? All right. This is the emptying port. You can see it on that one too. The emptying port at the bottom of the um, bag. This emptying port it just slides right out of its house. It just slides right out like that. This port can't touch anything, nothing. In order to open it, it's a T valve. So we're simply gonna slide it to the side and that opens it. We don't wanna put it open away. We have to close it to put it away. So we take it out of its little house. We open it, we empty it not letting that port touch anything. Once it's empty, we close it and put it back up into its house without letting it touch anything. We used to clean these off with alcohol afterwards to try to reduce any pathogens from getting into the bag. But what we found is that the alcohol is a very drying agent and it would dry out the plastic and cause micro cracks to form, which was warm, dark, moist. And it actually contributed to a problem that we created. So we don't do that anymore. Our whole goal here is to not let this port touch anything. Not the bed, not the chucks, not your hands, not the cup, nothing. They're watching for that. So when you go to open this, this T-valve, what a lot of students do is they put their fingers here to try to open it. Don't do that. We can't touch this end of the port. So you've got to figure out how to do this without contaminating that port. This is going to take a little bit of practice on your part. This is one skill that you need to be practicing in here. Okay, good. <coughs> now, when we're emptying this, just like when we did catheter care, we want to look at the bag to make sure it's not near the floor. We want to look at the tubing, make sure that's not coiled near the floor. Make sure it's on the bed with enough slack so that the patient can move in the bed. Um, you want to do those same checks that we did with catheter care. 
So when we take this cup, we've emptied it into the cup and we took the cup over to the bathroom to measure it. Remember, you can't carry an open container of urine through a room. So that chucks that we had the, the um, container set on, that chucks is gonna wrap around the container, just like we did with the bed pan. We wrap the chucks around the bed pan. We're gonna wrap the chucks around the urine container, take it over to the bathroom, and we're gonna sit it on the lid of the toilet. And when we do that, we're gonna open that chucks up and then we have to get down and measure this on a barrier, on a flat surface at eye level. Now, all three of those are on the same checkpoint. On a barrier, on a flat surface, at eye level. So if you miss any of that, you've missed the whole line. On a barrier, on a flat surface, at eye level. So that means you can't hold that cup up to read it you have to get down to eye level to read it. Good. Questions? We're going to document this again. This is on page 121. This is the documentation form and we want to make sure that we're putting it under output. So we're going to put the time Military time is best. If you don't know military time, you can use regular time, but you must include AM or PM if you use regular time. Very important. Okay, military time is best. And then you want to put the type of output. Urine is not the only thing that can come out of the human body. There's lots of things that can come out of the human body but urine is one of them. So we're gonna put urine there. We're gonna put the amount of urine that we measure, and then we're gonna put our initials. Documentation is going to be done after hand washing, after the skill is complete. And then once you've documented, what do you need to do? Wash your hands again. Good. Questions? Okay, I'm gonna show you the video on this one because it's got good pair or good close-ups. I want you, when you watch this video, I'm actually gonna zoom in on the urine container. And I want you to see if you can figure out what looking at that container, how much urine is in there. And then when I <laughs> document it at the end, see if your number matches or comes close. Now for the test, you can be 50 cc's off in either direction. So if the nurse got 350, if you got 300, 325, 350, 375, or 400, you're considered accurate. That's a huge margin of error. Huge. This whole video only takes five minutes and that's for the entire day. So plenty of time for you. If you look at the bottom of the screen or bottom of the page, they give you nine minutes. your urinary drainage bag. Is that okay? Okay, I'm going to close your curtain, wash my hands, get my supplies, and I'll be right back. 
for this seal, I'll need a barrier, which I'll place on the floor under the drainage bag. I'm going to need a set of gloves. And I'm going to need a triangular graduate container. I want to inspect the catheter tubing to make sure that it's coiled on the bed and the patient isn't lying on it and it's not pink, but also that it's not hanging near the floor where somebody might get their feet tangled up in it and strip or accidentally rip the catheter out. This catheter looks like it's in the appropriate position. We'll now remove the port from its protective sleeve on the bag. Sliding the valve to the side will open the port. We can now position this open port over the graduated container and tilt the bag slightly to the side to allow the contents to drain into the graduated container. While doing so, we want to be careful not to allow that port to touch any other surface. Once the urine bag has been empty, we'll slide the port back to the side to close it and very carefully insert it back into its protective sleeve. We want to make sure that the bag is hanging on a non-movable part of the bed and it's not touching the floor. We can now fold the chucks over the graduate container for safe and secure transport to the patient's bathroom. Once we're at the patient's bathroom, we're going to set the graduate container down on a barrier on a flat surface and position it so that we can read it. We need to be at our level and we're going to round to the nearest line, either up or down. You can see that the urine in this container is nearest to the mark of 425, so the amount that we will document is 425 milliliters, or cc's. Once we've measured it on a barrier, on a flat surface, at eye level, we can now empty the urinary graduate container. We'll throw the barrier away, open up the toilet, and we're going to dump the contents of the graduate container into the toilet. Now we're going to rinse the graduate container. We'll deposit the rinse water into the toilet as well. Now we can clean. After dumping the rinse water into the toilet, we'll set it down, use a paper towel to pick it up, paper towel to dry the outside, Pink towel to dry the inside. We'll discard this and then one for the drawer. We're going to place the graduate container in the bottom drawer and close the drawer with the paper towel. Okay, now I'll throw the paper towels away and remove my gloves. We'll throw those away as well. Thank you very much, Ms. Jones. Is there anything else I can get for you while I'm here? A magazine, perhaps? Do you have your call out there? If you should need anything at all, please feel free to let me know. I'm going to open your curtain, wash my hands, and document my skill. Thank you. After washing my hands, I'll document on the intake and output sheet that the evaluator gives me. I'm going to document the time of output, the type of output, which is urine, the amount of output in CCs and my initials. After documenting, I'll review the steps of my skill, make any corrections, and then tell the evaluator my skill is done. Okay. Uh, you two people, I apologize. I did not have my microphone on earlier. <laughs> so I hope you were able to hear. Okay, any questions on that? Any questions? Those are all the skills. We're done. You've learned successfully learned all of the skills that you could be tested on during the CNA exam. So now it's practice. And you're gonna to have to practice these. Um, they're not 
quite as easy as they look on the surface. They are easy, but they're only easy after you've done them once or twice. So you've got to put the time in and practice, okay? The one thing that I want to mention is on the videos that, that I've showed you in here and that you see online, um, these videos were, they were done in 2016. They're all still very, very relevant. The skills have not changed. The steps have not changed with the exception of I've instructed you on numerous occasions to wash your hands after documentation. You do not see that on these videos because that is a relatively new requirement. So I'm getting ready to redo the videos, but please remember when you're watching the videos, that step isn't reinforced. So you have to, to kind of make the, the change in your mind with that. Okay, questions? No? All right, uh, YouTube, we are going to uh, go on break and we're going to wrap up class today. Um, so I will, uh, on break, I'm going to get to the questions that were um, put in the chat and then I'm going to end the live stream for today uh, so that you guys can practice. So go ahead and go on break, come back at 10 after and the rest of the class will be practiced. You have almost two hours of practice today. Okay, so my YouTube people, I'm going to go type in instructions or uh, answers on the chat, and then I'll end the live stream. If you've got any questions, go ahead and put them in now.
Are there places that you want to go? I'm sorry? Do you have places that you want to go? Yes, are you looking for a brand name? Yeah. Okay. If you can go right next door to the retail store, Jacob is in there, he'll be happy to help you. It's right in the middle of the class right now, okay. but he'll be happy to help you. We have a class starting on the 12th. Okay, thank you. Thank, thank you. You too. Yeah. Even on his left side.
that he was on a person. Yeah, yeah, that's not yeah. a real person. I did it on my mom. Did you? Yeah. Um, it's I was like, yeah, it's like the hardest part. Yeah, yeah, yeah. she ain't working out too. I was well. like, the power was like on behind your back. She's like, it's memory foam. <laughs> Yeah, you gotta have a good squeaky dog. You wanna lay down for me? I can. Okay. Now the three parts. Arm, leg, back. I don't have any back. Uh, no. Like you have a over. Yeah. You just have to position the leg and arm under it. Mm -hmm. I don't know uh, I think they can do that, but they can't assist the uh, the thumbs. Yeah, rolling over. You're gonna put me on my what left side? Left side. Okay. Yeah, you can move to the side of the bed. I can assist you if I move to the side. Yeah, I can put my over the right side. So I'm gonna roll you this way, right? You're gonna roll me what way? This way. Be on your left side. You gotta be this way. Wait a minute, you're laying there. Yeah, so you're going to be over here. Yeah, I'm going to be standing. So I need to be over here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to make you feel bad for that. Okay, can you scoot to me? Okay. Okay, so holding this. That was going here. Arm here. Okay. Uh, legs. I forget the legs. Where the legs? This one goes up and flat. That's what up I and flat. flat. And this one is? Just move it out a little bit. Yeah. Okay. We're going to roll you over on this. You want to grab your bed? I can just grab it lay on the bed. On the back. One, two, three. Are you in the middle of the bed? Have it rolled over on you? What is this one? <laughs> Me too, well, me too. No, I can't go. I'm going to pull the blanket up and take this out and put the pillow over it. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Can this be over all day? Yep. That was the hardest part. Can you feel anything? <laughs> yep. Oh, cool. And then, do I have to do them all from the, let me flip it here. Do you want one under here? Yeah, you gotta put it on the Okay, are you comfortable? I honestly thought it was like fear, but I guess fear, yeah, would make more sense. Oh, I don't know. I think I go up to the under the arm. Yeah. Lift top arm and place pillow under arm, ensuring comfort. Do not place the pillow over the head. Ensure patient's head is well supported. Yeah, then just make sure the pillow behind my head is not under my shoulder. Where's my call light? Do you want to try it again? I'll try it again. Okay. I literally have a strong feeling that that's going to be what a picture. Thank you. Um, yeah. I got no clue. That or make occupied bed. That doesn't smell it. Occupied bed, I think. Yeah. You want to go under this one? Isn't 
Let's see. Wait, what? Okay. <laughs> All right, let's see. Yeah, okay. Hello, Mrs. Jones. I'm Jenny. I'm going to be your CNA today. Okay. Can we get you in a side line for this one? Sure. Okay. Let's go with your card. I'm going to wash my hands. I don't want to say it one more time. <laughs> What skill are you trying to do? Five line position. Are you? And then put gather all your supplies. Okay. What's the first card you can find? The fourth one would be like that. Yeah, I forget the call. <laughs> okay. I'm gonna have a little Yeah. It's quite in the I noticed that when you explain everything, it makes it easier to remember the stuff. True. I think I'm, it's gonna be a problem for me. I'm used to, I took care of my grandpas and my grandmother, and they all had dementia. And my grandma was completely deaf, so like, it, there was no verbal with a lot of it. So I think that's gonna be a Scoot towards me. Now, why would you put the class on if you don't have to keep in the seat? <laughs> <laughs> Do we have to put the seat down? I'm, I'm just asking. Ah, that's a good question. I think so, because I'll get all tangled up in it. Oh, okay. Uh, uh, and you'll have someone wants to read the yeah, thingy doodle. Well, wait, what are you doing? Sideline. Oh, yeah. I don't want to get caught. Now, come on, because we're doing it. Let's see. Yeah. Location, this has to give me location of full top shoes down the foot of the back. This is the one you have so to cross have their to arms, to right? This top seat all the way down so you don't get tangled in it. I'm going to have this move towards me. Okay. Okay, and now we're going to put your arm across your chest. I can put the one above your head. Then we're going to put this one up. Okay, let's flatten it out. And we're going to lay this one out a little bit far. Okay. 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 I was holding my boobs. <laughs> it's going to fall out the side. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. So we're going to place this pillow on your back. So roll out. Is this the one like where the pillow? Yeah. This is where it's going to be placed. Yeah. And then we're going to put this pillow between your legs. Now, should we have taken the curtain this down first? What do you mean? What do you mean? Oh. Huh? I don't know. I'm just asking. <laughs> it's a well, I don't know if I to talk to you on that. I don't know. Um. So, oh, girl, don't ask me. I can't remember. Don't that was like one of the first videos. Oh no, top two is last. Okay. okay. We got this. We got this. We got this. We got this. Your UT is here for oh, class okay. seven. All right, you two people, see you later. I'm logging off now so the students can practice. I do. Are you comfortable? Okay.
I'm going to wash my hands.